motherfucker. Game & Watch Gallery 4 is dope. As a guy who can't devote himself to big long games, this right here is a treat for me. Basically, this video will be analyzing the modern games on the hard difficulty, and on topics such as sprite work, gameplay, or whatever I find interesting about the game. For example, every time the title screen loads up, a select group of background characters will be animated while the others remain completely still. With that out of the way, let's get into the games now, shall we? The first game on our list is Fire, and this one's pretty simple, actually. You can only move left, right, or center, and only three types of characters come out of the castle. Also the egg. Eeks. The egg contains either a helpful moon, which gives you five points every single bounce on the way to the cart, or a bob bomb Bombs? You want it? Which gives you no points, and gives you a miss if you carry it all the way to the cart. The egg does not count as a miss if you actually let it drop, so you can honestly take your chances with it or just completely ignore it. Fuck! A good piece of advice to know for this game is to use both the A and B buttons and the D-pad to move. Sometimes you might find that the odds are against you and you might have to juggle two people at once, but using the advice before, you can make some serious game-changing plays. Nice. The game looks gorgeous and goes through a morning, evening, and night cycle every 200 points. That's all I really have to say about Fire. It's not one of my favorite games, but it's also not one of my least favorite games. I just find it a little slow for my liking and also a little, uh, boring. I'd say I'd give this game like a 3 out of 5, you know, it's got good uh, music, it's got good sprite work, but it kind of lacks in the gameplay department. It's not nearly as fun or engaging as some of the other games on the list, but we'll get to them later. Moving on. Alright, well, second game on the list is boxing, and honestly, this one's probably the easiest game out of all of them. Alright, so the broken strategy in this game is basically just lean back, look at the opponent's gloves, aim accordingly, and then punch in whatever position actually counters them. If their gloves are high, you attack from below. If their gloves are low, then you attack from above. If it doesn't work, then just try again, bro. Simple as that. Other than that, there's a few other things to note too, like how you can actually punish an opponent for throwing a punch. If your opponent throws out a punch and it either misses or you block it, you can throw out a counter punch and it's usually guaranteed to hit. During the course of the animation of throwing a punch, you're left vulnerable, even if your gloves are in the right position to block. And if I'm honest, the game is kind of fuck ugly sprite work. Luigi kind of looks fucked in the face, while Luigi's pants are not the right color, Boo has way more dithering than even the worst of Gen 3 sprites, and Wiggler looks... okay. I'd give this game a 2.5 out of 5. If I'm honest, the gameplay is... it's okay, it didn't really challenge me though. The music's great, the sprite work's kind of ugly. Other than that, there's really not much to say about this game. The third game on the watch chain thing is Rain Shower. Oh boy. Yeah, it's kind of a slow game. Alright, well, right off the bat, this is one of those games that I never really enjoyed much, even as a kid. You basically can only move four positions and just kind of wait for things to happen so that you can move more things. It's... riveting. Bowser can sometimes throw moons, when which collected, fill up a little meter on the bottom right of the screen. Collect five moons and this happens. Hey, oh! hey look, 20 points! Something to point out though, is that once you start collecting moons, try your best not to miss anything. For once you get a miss, your entire moon streak is gone. Finito. Fuck. Waluigi also appears in this game and he's a lean, mean, nasty son of a hoe. He'll show up intermittently just to fuck with your clotheslines and whoever may be on it. His main goal might be to screw you over, but sometimes Waluigi accidentally helps you too. Yo, thanks, homie. Every 100 points, Mario will decide to stop time and change the seasons simultaneously. He then steps on a P-switch and every single balloon still in the air gets turned into coins. They don't actually count towards the point total, though. Collecting the coins just gives you a flat 10 points. Then you start from the beginning. Every now and then, Bowser goes full retard and decides to throw green balloons when there's nobody in range. I can't even move people across the lines to actually get hit. You fucking stooge. The four seasons in the game are summer, Fall, Winter, and Spring. All in that order. Oh yeah, one more thing, Rain Shower has the best music, in my opinion, in this game. I fucking love this theme. So overall, I think I'm gonna give this game about a 3 out of 5. 
The gameplay is pretty good, it's a little slow for my liking. The backgrounds are nice, the music is great, I don't know what more I can ask for except for maybe a different game. Yeah, let's go. Man, if you thought Rain Shower was slow, then check out the next game on the list, Mario Cement Factory. Oh boy. I know what I said last game, but this is truly the game where you just sit around and wait for things to happen. I mean, things get hectic later on, obviously, but like, it's a real slog to get through this game. Every now and then a boo comes over and takes refuge inside your oven. Get him the fuck out of there and you're rewarded with zero points. <sighs> it could give you trouble if you forget, so always pay attention. Now unlike classic mode, Mario can actually fall in between platforms and through them even if there's a gap. Keeping all that in mind, you can perform some pretty tricky platform movement to get from side to side, depending on where the urgency is. Now unlike a lot of games on this list, Mario's Cement Factory takes place indoors and it's about as fun to look at as an office cubicle. Your eyes are bombarded with drab industrial colors and the character sprites are just kind of there. At least it's got a banging soundtrack, but then again that doesn't really mean much considering this entire game is a banging soundtrack. Compared to the other modern games in the Game Watch series, this one doesn't do much to make itself stand out, like, at all. Now, despite all the shit talk I've said about this game, I actually kind of like it. But I don't know why, so I'm not gonna really let it affect my review. This game deserves a 1.5 out of 5, like, at most. The next game on the list is Donkey Kong Jr., and, uh, I got a lot of stuff to talk about with this one. The movement in this game is way more fluid, way more crisp, and way more fun than any other game on this list. It honestly doesn't even feel like a Game & Watch title, but it is, and because of that, sometimes you have to plan your moves very carefully. Bullet Bills are probably the enemy that'll give you the hardest time of them all. Sporting a deceptively large hitbox, these guys like to fly around in the most inconvenient of paths. Play it safe and show them the respect that they deserve by staying clear out of their path. At least until level 2 anyways. Alright, so level 2 is the one where the game breaking action begins. On this level and this level alone, you can pass right through enemies that are between the bird and DK's cage. How does he do that? This only works when you're transitioning from the bird to the cage, and the enemies can still hurt you while you're still standing on the bird. Level 3 is basically level 1, except you have to deal with both nipper plants and goombas! The nipper plants in this level can either deny your progress through a level, or deny you the ability to jump without taking damage. If you find yourself face to face with both a nipper plant and a goomba, try walking back a bit. Let the goomba come to you, because the nipper plant sure as hell ain't gonna be catching up to you, or the goomba. This game is one of the faster paced ones, and actually rewards you for speed depending on how long it takes for you to get through the whole obstacle course. If you play this game at the pace that I like to play this game, you're probably gonna get about 200 points every time you loop back around to level 1. Three levels with different layouts and three individual music tracks makes this easily the most ambitious game on this list. The environments themselves are gorgeous and the accompanying music with it always seems to fit just right in. Now in my opinion, this game is the creme de la creme. This is the absolute gold standard to which modern Game & Watch games should be like. I love this game and I'm giving it a 5 out of 5 baby! Oh yeah, I love this game! And again with the two player romps, it's Donkey Kong 3. I didn't actually play this game much as a kid just because I was terrified of it. The ghost and the accompanying sound actually scared me for some reason. Ugh. This game actually requires a lot of knowledge in order to get good at, and that's what I'm here to teach you. What I usually like to do is watch the position of the boo and the fireball since they don't really like to stand in one place for too long. Keeping the three lanes in mind, your job is to understand where the boo or the fireball is going to go before you take your shot. This becomes harder to pull off as the distance between the boo and the fireball and you widens. So try to adjust accordingly. The boo likes to sneak up on you when you have your back turned, so it's best to keep looking at the boo as long as possible, even when collecting water. Don't just stand there with your back turned or else the boo is gonna spook ya! Instead, collect the water as it drops from the pipe so that you can prevent any sort of advances from the boo. The boo and the fireball can't overlap during normal conditions, so it's best to save your bubble if there's one in front of the other. Keeping that in mind though, you can force a checkmate scenario if you can end up getting the boo and the fireball right in front of DK, with one right behind the other. If your bubble manages to hit an enemy right before an opponent's does, then your bubble will pass right through his, cancelling his out. The game looks pretty good, the background environment's very nice and fitting, and it even has a little portrait of that boo that you really need to watch out for. 
Now since I'm a big boy now and I've already faced my fears, I can actually give this game a nice rating and you know what? I actually really like it. I'm probably going to give it a 4 out of 5 just because the gameplay is pretty good, it keeps you on your toes, and not to mention the surprising depth for a Game & Watch game. Cool, so shifting over from the 6 games in one on the left side, we have 5 additional games on the right, starting with Chef! Alright, so this is arguably one of the fastest paced games on the list, and therefore it's automatically good, right? Yes! But there is a catch. Some inherent flaw in this game's core design that I cannot ignore. Yoshi. In this game, Yoshis go through a life cycle. First you have a baby Yosho, and then it evolves into Yoshi, and then it evolves into Yoshi pooping out an egg. Haha, <laughs> the egg will hatch into a baby Yosho, and when that happens, Yoshi will run off screen and die, presumably, leaving you with all sorts of child support bills to pay. No wonder why you're working in food service. Alright, so when Yosho evolves into Yoshi, he undergoes a very familiar looking evolution. While evolving, Yoshi has to stay rooted in one place, meaning that if you turn to get Yoshi to go and collect some food that you're trying to drop onto him, it won't work, earning a miss. It's like the game is actively punishing you for playing the game properly, because this is the same shit that happens when you feed Yoshi burnt food. Strangely enough, this actually doesn't happen if food is being dropped right on top of Yoshi as he's evolving. He'll just cancel out his evolution animation and instantly eat the food. Once in a blue moon, Yoshi will undergo a game-breaking glitch where he'll just exit stage right only to return stage left in an infinite loop. Every attempt I've made to recreate the glitch has not worked so far. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to see it again. Anyways, enough about Yoshi, let's go back to Chef. Mario and Luigi will throw out five different kinds of food at you, each having their own individual stats. Cooked eggs will give you two points, but take three bounces to cook. Peppers give you four points, but take four bounces to cook. Fish give you seven points and take four bounces to cook. Steaks give you four points and take five bounces to cook. And lobsters give you seven points, but take five bounces. The game takes place in a kitchen, presumably in Peach's Castle. It looks okay here, I'm just a little bored by it. But things change once you get 200 points. Now you're outside in a romantic setting in a beautiful courtyard with Princess Peach's castle looming right over you. It's all accompanied by some beautiful music that fits everything to a T. Now, with all that in mind, including all of my criticisms about Yoshi, I'm gonna give this game a 4.5 out of 5. It's incredibly well paced, I love the bonuses granted by Yoshi, but I do not like some of the things that Yoshi does, but that's probably a fault of the developers. It's a tiny blemish on what would otherwise be a pretty perfect game. Yoshi, you fucking asshole! Alright, the second game is Mario Brothers. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Alright, I gotta admit, there's not much to do with this game. It has relatively the same amount of depth as Mario Cement Factory, only with less of the playtime. Now, normally you can control both Mario and Luigi, but if you have a friend, you can assign them to play as one of the brothers while you play as the other. All for that sweet gamer romance. You can delay when you collect the cake to, uh, space things out, maybe? Every now and then, Bowser will angrily stomp the oven, causing everything to move in reverse. There's two ways to deal with this. One is to let all the cake flow in reverse and send it all back up into the pipe in which it came from, and the other is to let either Luigi or Mario hit the switch, but if Luigi does it, then... Jesus, how'd they get away with that? Even though there's no moon mechanic in this game, there's a delivery truck system that works surprisingly like rain showers moons do. The trucks require 8 cakes to be completely filled, and when that happens, Wario will drive off with all the product and come back empty-handed, waiting for another load. It earns you a little bonus and gives you a little truck icon. If you collect 5 of those truck icons, then this happens. Also previously mentioned in Rain Shower, if you actually lose a life while collecting trucks, it's over, baby! I like the music in this game, but I really can't find that much else to like about it. Visually, this game is kind of unspectacular. Reminds me a lot of Mario Cement Factory, and you already know my opinion on that. I'd say the best thing this game has going for it is its pacing, which is actually not that bad. As wholly unspectacular as this game is, I'm still down to give it like a 2.5 out of 5. Thank god the pacing's decent, or else it would have been lower. The third unlockable game is Donkey Kong, and thankfully, unlike Mario Brothers, this is based on the arcade version. Alright, I gotta keep it real with you guys. This is just a worse Donkey Kong Jr. It's the same shit, you basically start at the bottom, you go right, then you go up, then you go left, then you go up, then you hit something on the left, 
Then you go over to the right, since there's now a platform there that you can advance to, go on that platform, finally go to the exit, do this process a few more times, and boom, you're on to the next level. The only difference being that Mario is way slower and less fun to control than our boy DK Jr. Aside from that, there's a few unique things this game has to it. Your main enemies in this game are Barrels and Koopas, neither of which are very threatening. Both are easily avoided by hanging onto a ledge in the middle of the stage, which kinda reminds me of another game I know with that layout. In addition, if barrels are entering the pipe right above you and you go through at the same time, you'll just completely pass right through them. This game also supports three unique levels, but only background-wise, as they don't contain different layouts or music. The platforms that appear when you hit the switch actually do vary between the levels though, and level 3 is where it gets kind of interesting. Now normally you can just blaze your way up the clouds and complete the first lap, but after that you gotta change up the timing just a smidgen. Unless you have frame perfect inputs, you're gonna have to wait for that second cloud to finish shrinking and growing again before you can successfully step on it. The game's environments are actually kinda cool, with the first one being set in the only indoor place I actually like. The second one is kinda just the same as DK Jr's first stage. The third one seems to take place in a cloudy area with an airship. These backgrounds all look pretty gorgeous, and they actually have the benefit of taking up two screens to have more detail. The game's pacing is quite like Donkey Kong Jr. actually, which is a great thing. Now I know this entire video has been me talking about how this is so similar to DK Jr., but that's not a bad thing, because this game gets a 4 out of 5 for it. It's a pale imitation in the grand scheme of things, but it's really not a bad game in its own right, especially compared to some of the other ones here. It just doesn't really have that much to offer in how it makes it unique. Hi, I'm going baby on baby. Uh -huh. That nigga a bitch. He think he a gangster. He probably still slang a 380. Hi. Now we're not quite done just yet. There's two more games to go, and the second last one is Octopus. There's two different ways you can play this game. The first way is how the devs intended, for you to go and grab treasure, then tread the gauntlet all the way back to Peach so that she can give you some bonus points. It's not as straightforward as classic mode though, as the more treasure you collect, the more you're weighed down and the more you're slowed. It'll be a long ways to go before you reach Peach, but you get a nice, meaty reward at the end of it. And the second way to play is basically just torturing the octopus a bunch. You can camp the treasure chest and keep yourself well supplied to attack the tentacles with your treasure. This strat is a little easier to pull off, as you only have to deal with two tentacles and really two spaces in which you need to go. Always keep in mind how much treasure you've collected, because your movement speed can either help you or really hinder you. Sometimes moving at a snail's pace could actually greatly help you, because it allows you to weave in between tentacles. And conversely, sometimes moving too fast can actually fuck you over. It's not exactly helpful advice, but if you throw your treasure at the tentacle as it's in this position, then it'll remain stuck there, until the octopus is done being stunned. Sometimes the octopus gets pissed off and then shoots an entire ink blob from its mouth, though most of the time it doesn't even hit its mark and you can just go on about your business. The underwater environment is really cool looking, and every 200 points the octopus will even change its color. Now an interesting thing to note about the music is that there's actually two different versions of the octopus main theme, though one doesn't even show up in the game. I don't know if you noticed, but the song I'm actually talking over right now is that unused version. It's got a little synth solo. Now with all that in mind, I'm gonna give this game a 3.5 out of 5 actually. The underwater atmosphere is beautiful, the music actually perfectly accompanies it, and it's kinda nice to have two different styles of gameplay that you can switch to on the fly. The only thing that's to this game's detriment is that sometimes it gets boring. Mashing A at the treasure is not exactly my idea of fun. Not only that, but the journey to Peach's boat if you have treasure can also break the pace of the game, especially if you have to actually sacrifice all your treasure just to hit a tentacle. Last but certainly not least, and certainly not a grand finale kind of deal, it's Fire Attack! In this game you basically have four positions you can move to, and thankfully you can also use the shoulder buttons to move diagonally. Usually you wait for enemies to start flashing before you know you can actually hit them, but you can actually do it slightly earlier. You can hit the bullet bill as soon as its little nose enters right inside the outer perimeter of your wall and bob bombs can be hit as soon as their top is exposed. Every now and then an apple will shoot out of the cannon, or a hen will run up and climb your structure. You can allow these guys in because they're worth bonus points. Now at first glance this game looks kind of bland, but all is revealed once something happens to your structure. Now that you know exactly what Wario is trying to protect, it gives you a good incentive on completing this game, doesn't it? The music is alright, but by far not one of my favorites. And honestly, that's all I can really say about this game. There's really not much to it. With that in mind, I'm gonna give this game about a 2.5 out of 5 rating. In my opinion, everything about this game is just kind of middle of the road, so the rating should be like that too. And with all that out of the way, we're finally done!